Good morning. Oh, wait, I, oh. <laughs> I'm, I have a very loud voice, as you could ask my old teacher, Mrs. Nelson, uh, so I'll try not to scream too loud into this microphone. Uh, but it's so interesting coming back to high school. I was, I was saying I just got landed from New York yesterday, and now I'm here. And coming back to Sudbury is just such a calming thing because you get to come back and see all your family and friends. Um, but then it quickly is a, a dose of reality when I'm back in, in a high school. Uh, not to tell you where I went to high school, because you may or may not be playing them in football tonight. Uh, I went to Lively High School, uh, so you can't hold that against me. But uh, it, it brings back a dose of reality where I was sitting in your exact shoes really not that many years ago. And being in grade 11 and 12 is such a tough period. It's a time when you have all those difficult questions as to what you want to do with your life, where you want to go, what you want to study, and you're being asked all these real life questions that frankly is really difficult to actually find the answers. And one thing that I never realized that I wish I knew when I was in your seat is that if you were to ask me to count probably on two hands what I thought I was going to do when I grew up, with all ten fingers I would have got them wrong. So everything that I thought that I was going to do in grade 12 and grade 11, and I was keen and I was involved and I was you know, thinking every single day about what that next step would look like. On all 10 fingers, every single one would have been wrong. I never thought that by the time I was 22 years old, I would have been running a technology company. And, uh, and as a result, I thought, you know, what better way than be able to share with all of you this non-linear path that brought me from Lively High School to now launching a technology company uh, around the world. And it may seem like a far stretch for all of you, but the one thing that we really share in common is the fact that we're born and raised in Northern Ontario. And uh, one thing about Northern Ontario, and as I go through this, you'll see that so many of my steps, the reason why I got to take two leaps forward in a lot of these situations was because of the things that I got only because I was from Northern Ontario. And when I was in high school, I would never have thought that. I always thought that being from a small town and being from a rural area was a bit of a challenge and a challenge that made me really nervous when I went off to school and studied with all these people from the big cities that had the big high schools but uh, in fact it was the biggest advantage and something that I hold close to my heart uh, every single day. So. Starting it all off, I mean, going to Lively High School, I was really involved. And one of the unique things about being from a small high school or a small community is that you can be involved and you can make a difference. And my parents, my mom who's here today, was always really involved in the community and doing things. And as somebody from the north, it's just in our DNA to be able to give back and get involved. And fortunately, when I was sitting down in, in Mrs. Nelson's guidance counsel office, guidance office trying to think of what I was going to do with my life, I was able to find a way to actually apply to scholarships. I don't know if any of you guys plan to, to apply to scholarships, but I highly recommend you spend at least five hours or more um, as you're in grade 12 looking at scholarships and opportunities because it was with those scholarships that I was able to get uh, basically a full ride to University of Waterloo, about $60,000 in scholarships to pay uh, for school. And that got me to go off to University of Waterloo to uh, study science. And I studied science because on those ten fingers there was a lot of science related careers. I loved school, I loved science, and uh, as a result I thought, you know, if you're really keen and you want to do big things, then of course you should become a doctor or a dentist or a pharmacist. And you know, the list went on in, in science related careers. And when I landed uh, at University of Waterloo in uh, uh, in, uh, I guess it would have been 2006, I can't tell you how excited I was when I landed on that school. I showed up in residence, I had my bags packed, I was going to meet all these new people, I thought it was time to just like launch this career because now I was in this university that I thought, you know, once you're in university, life is just, is set and you're good to go. It's not true. And I showed up at my guidance counselor's office because I was in this thing called co-op. And when I sat down in, in a room, I said, where can I work? Can I go work at Google or Facebook or one of these big tech companies? And, and she laughed and, and she said, Dave, you need to relax. You're in first year university. You're going to be filing papers for a lot of years. And I was so puzzled because I, I went from lively off to university and I finally got into this gig and I said, well, I'm in university. Shouldn't I be getting all these amazing jobs and shouldn't I get to go run businesses and, and do interesting things? And she said, uh, absolutely not. That's something that you, know, you work towards and after a few years, then you could potentially do that if you're lucky. 
And I walked out of that and I remember calling my parents and just being like, this university is a ripoff. You, can, you go off to school, you've been working so hard, and you're going to file papers? Is that really why I went off to school? And so after that, I, I thought and I brainstormed, how could I use all these years of working in my community and getting involved in my high school that I was only able to do because I went to a small community high school to be able to get a job? Because those types of experiences are so transferable. So as you guys think about those 40 hours of volunteer work, I mean, just, that should just be the beginning. Because the things that you get to do as a volunteer or somebody in a small community will get you better jobs and better opportunities than anybody else. And we have a really unique opportunity than anybody else in Canada. And because of all that experience, I was able to actually get a job in Calgary being the spokesperson for the federal government. So off I went to Calgary. I, was, uh, I just turned 19 years old, and I was the spokesperson for the federal government speaking about youth, speaking about us. Um, and I know I'm a few years older than all of you, but I'm spe I was speaking about all of you as well. And the different opportunities that we have as young people with this thing called the internet and social media and stuff that you're like, yeah, whatever, Dave, I know that, I use it every day. People were Snapchatting when I was in here. Like, it's something that we know, but it's actually this thing that's changing the world that our generation is just at the cusp of. And as people from rural areas in Northern Ontario, our lives have been built on this social communications and getting involved in our community, which social media has enabled other people to do, but we've been doing that for years. And when I was out in Calgary, I started touring around media outlets talking about youth and how we had this unique opportunity to bridge this gap between young people and this thing that I like to call the real world. So the real world being industry, companies, government, and academia. And how us as young people have these amazing skill sets, but we weren't, we weren't getting across to this real world, and the real world wasn't getting across to us. So as a result, we have twice the unemployment rate of any other generation, twice. It's a, it's a, it's a staggering number that all of us are gonna be faced with. And that's when I realized that the missing piece between young people and this real world was this idea of opportunity and how opportunity, I think, I imagine if I say opportunity to you guys, you think jobs, I imagine. Um, but opportunity is actually something way different than that. And so we uh, started going around the Canadian government and then I went back to Toronto after that, um, to Waterloo to get my next job. And uh, when I was at a conference, uh, Speak, there was a, a speaker on stage and I remember distinctively being in this audience of people from all over Canada and I didn't know a single person because all of my friends um, were from Northern Ontario and none of the people from biochemistry went to this conference because everyone was going med school bound and this is when I started getting this curiosity that maybe med school wasn't really for me and then maybe this thing called business was actually quite interesting um, and to give you an idea I actually never studied a business course in my life so everything that I've done as an entrepreneur has been through books and reading and volunteerism and, and, and social entrepreneurship ventures. And at this conference, there's this woman that was speaking, and <clears throat> it, was, it was such an exciting time for me because I was like, I want to work for that person. It was no different than, than what's going on here, except I was in that seat and she was up here. And she was talking about all these interesting projects, and after the conference, all these people lined up to be able to talk to her. And I was like, I guess I need to go and try to talk to her because I need to get a job. And uh, I was in biochemistry, so everybody else was in business. So I didn't really have like the foundation. I had been getting turned down from jobs because of my resume uh, being all about biochemistry and not actually taking into consideration the real things that I had done. So I was feeling a little defeated. So what was one more you know, kick at the can? So I came up and chatted with her. And when I, I asked her, I said, could we go for coffee? And uh, she kind of chuckled. She said, you know, why don't you go onto my website and send an email to the general help inbox. Has anyone used a general help inbox? It's like a black, like a, a black hole of no response. And she said, just go into that help inbox. Somebody from my team will get in touch and we'll try to arrange a time to go for coffee. And then somehow in that short period of time, she realized I was from Northern Ontario and so was she. And she was the CEO of one of the largest organizations that looks after marketing and communications. She said, wait, you're from Lively? Uh, and I said, yes. She's like, here, and she goes into her purse and she grabs a business card and she kind of sneaks it to me so that nobody else in this audience would see it. She said, here, send me a direct email. We're gonna go for coffee and I'm gonna help you out however you need it. And I never thought that this network from Northern Ontario that I never thought existed actually got me this first coffee conversation with this, this um, CEO. 
And so we went out uh, for coffee, and I had a portfolio full of all the things that I'd done in high school and university. And it was just using all these different things from right from the times that I was in Northern Ontario to university to be able to show the things that I had actually done versus the things that I was learning in school. And uh, when I sat down and I was going through this portfolio, she looked at me and she said, we needed to meet again. Like, this is very interesting. So let's schedule something in my office. And so I walked away, I went back to my friends, I said, I think I'm getting a job, finally. And uh, when I went back into her office, uh, a few weeks later, she was walking in and it was this massive, like, think downtown Toronto company. Uh, I, got lo I was on a GPS trying to find her office because I had no idea how to get around Toronto. And I showed up at her office and as she was walking in, everybody from these cubicles stopped and looked at her. And she just had such presence to her that I was like, like who is she and like, how did she get to where she was today? And, and when she came up, I said, so when did you start working as the CEO at this company? And she said, uh, I actually didn't start working here. I started this company when I was 28 years old. I was like, what? Like, what does it mean to start a, like, what is that? It didn't make sense to me what, it, what starting a company really was. So I said, no, but when did you actually start, like, when did you apply? Like, when did you use your resume to come here and get the job as the CEO to run this massive organization? And she kind of chuckled. She said, no, no, no. I started this company when I was 28 years old. And I had never taken an entrepreneurship class. I didn't really know what entrepreneurship really was. I looked at it as though, like just as a confused state that all of a sudden she had a company. Kind of like how young kids think babies are born, like this, a baby is finally just created out of the stomach. And, uh, and when she sat me down at the boardroom table, I was still so confused, but I was so excited to be able to talk to her about how you actually start a company. And so I sat down, I said, okay, I have a ton of questions about how you started a company. And she said, no, 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 I have five minutes to talk to you. And uh, so I was hoping maybe there was just a job offer or something coming. And she said, uh, I have five minutes to talk to you, but I have something really simple to say. She's like, you either need to start a company or I'm not going to talk to you again. And I just heard about the notion of starting a company a few steps back. And so I said, well, what is that? Like, I'm still trying to understand what that means. And she said, you need to take all the things that you've done in Northern Ontario working with your community, working with young people, and then being a spokesperson for the government. And you need to go and do that with large companies. I didn't know a single large company, so this lady was crazy. And, uh, and she said, you need to do it. So I have five minutes, any questions? And so like, my heart was just like pumped, like where do you even begin? What kind of questions do you ask? And so it was an awkward silence for probably 30 seconds as I stuttered and murmured and tried to think about what I'd ask this woman that I thought I was just gonna get a job, but now she's challenging me to start a company or she's not gonna talk to me again. And this is the first contact I have in Toronto. I don't know anybody else. So if I lose her, I've got nothing. So I said, what are the first three things I need to do if I decide to start a company? And she said, uh, you need to uh, create a business name, create business cards, and just go and start talking to people. Just go and start telling people all the things that you've done in Northern Ontario and the things that you've done for the federal government as you travel to all the media uh, to talk to them about how you could engage youth. And organizations need this because there's this huge gap, and I really think that you can solve it. And I said, um, I said, okay. And I said, is there any other, like, can I call you in a few weeks if I actually start this? She said, absolutely. And her secretary came in and pulled her out, and that was the end of my meeting. So I walked out of her office, a little bit of defeat, a little bit of excitement, a little bit of curiosity. And I got on uh, to my phone, and I emailed a recruiter. I had a, a full-time job to go and work at Procter & Gamble in marketing. And I emailed her, and I said, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity for a job, but I'm actually going to start a company. And I was 21 years old at the time. And I got an email like 10 minutes later from this recruiter saying, oh, that's so, I think it said something along the lines of, that's so cute, good luck, let me know if you need a job. <laughs> and so that was my first email of becoming an entrepreneur. And so off I went, I went back to university, I sat down with my friends, I gave them a case of beer to build me a website, and I created this company called Redwood. And the idea behind Redwood was that if we could give opportunity to young people, and if we could actually empower them with the tools that they needed and be able to use these 21st century skill sets that companies that are spending millions of dollars to try to connect with young people through you know, concerts and free giveaways and things that weren't actually meaningful, we could actually create this generation 
uh, kind of blend between baby boomers and young people that would be the most powerful generation partnership in the world that the, the history has ever seen. Because we'd have people that have historical knowledge that have turned the economies around, our parents and, and our grandparents' uh, generation, and then we'd have us who are faster thinkers, who have had access to education before anybody else. We'd have this superpower. And so uh, I created this website, and I handed out probably 500 business cards. And the reason why I know it was, a, it was actually a little bit more than 500 is because each batch of 100 was about $30, and it was running me dry of money. $30, <laughs> $30 for another 100 And every time I handed these 100 business cards out, I'd wait, and I got no callbacks. And I just got back on the horse, and I'd go hand out another 30 And I would do it again. And then suddenly, I had to do some math, and I realized that in order for me to be able to go back to school, to finish my, because I was still, at this point, I was just going into third year university. So I had to pay for school if I wanted to go back. Otherwise, I was going to be coming back home, which wouldn't be a bad thing, Mom. But I would have been working in a completely different job than what I had dreamed of doing. And so I realized that I needed $4,000 to combine with my scholarship to finish off the year. And that $4,000 $4, is a lot of money to try to earn when you're 21 years old. And I uh, went out and I realized that I had two months. So after I handed those 500 business cards, nothing worked. So I took a step back and thought, how can I actually use technology and actually build a product that could sell this a lot faster? And so I built this first iteration of a product um, that was a loyalty program that gives savings to university students. And within four weeks after that, I had over $120,000 of revenue, which for people that are studying accounting, with $120,000 of revenue, you should be asking, well, how much costs are in that? And there was less than $10,000 of costs. So suddenly, I was doing OK. And I had this product that was actually working. And so at that point, I finally felt the confidence to email this crazy lady back that told me to quit my job to start a company. And I gave her an update. And I gave her my, my, spread, my balance sheet with all the updates of the money that I had made. Uh, and I said, now what do I do? I had this business. I, ha I had hired two people at that point to be able to grow. And uh, so I, I sent off the note to ask her, like, what actually comes next? And within 10 minutes, my phone rang, and it was her. And she's like, what? She's like, you actually started a company? She's like, I thought I was never going to hear from you again. She's like, this is crazy. She's like, get on a bus, come to Toronto. I have dinner reservations. We're going to brainstorm, and I'm going to get you to go and pitch Microsoft. And, uh, and I said, OK, I'll catch the next Greyhound bus from Waterloo to go to Toronto, and I'll pitch Microsoft. And I didn't even know what that meant. And uh, keep in mind, I was on my bike selling the stuff that I just talked to you about with a backpack, with business cards that were the cheapest business cards that the printer would print. And I went to Toronto, and I sat down, and she said, in two weeks from now, Microsoft is it's a process called an RFP, where it's basically an auction, where they auction off their business and all these people compete. And I'm going to get you on the list so that you can give it a, sh you can give it a shot. And I said, so like, what, are the, what are the first three steps I've got to do? She said, you need to create a deck. You need, you need to get the brief. You need to create a deck. And then you need to practice pitching it, a deck being the presentation of, of uh, of what we were going to, what our company did. At this point, the company didn't really exist. It was me on my bike, but now we had a company. So uh, I asked her if I could meet her a week before the presentation. Then I built my first presentation. And it talked about how if Microsoft could give opportunity to young people, that Microsoft could actually build relationships with young people in a way that they would buy their products. Really simple. And, that, and I had this whole plan of how they could do it. And I showed up on the Greyhound bus to their office. Everyone else had like fancy cars, and I had my backpack, and I was trying to like act the part a little bit. Because I mean, if you're going to go for it, you got to go for it. And uh, so I showed up, and I pitched. And uh, a few days later, I got a call, and I won it. And all of a sudden, things got really real, because I was going to launch our first ever national back to school program across the country. I was in third year university. I had, I had made my $4,000 that I needed to go back to school, so now I was just I was bulletproof. And uh, we ended up launching their back-to-school program, and it became their most successful back-to-school program in the world, out of Canada. And that's when I started getting calls. And I actually got pulled into a meeting by these executives. 
And they said something very simple. They said, we'll keep working with you, but you've got to drop out of school because you can't just be coming with your green backpack full of textbooks to our office after 5 p.m. after your classes to do our work. And, uh, and it was a little bit of them that alluded to that, but it was really a lot of my advisors that, that, told, that gave me that ultimatum. They said, if you really want to be serious about this, you've got to, you've got to make some changes. And school for me was like the biggest dream that I'd had to be able to go off to university. Remember how I told you when I went to that University of Waterloo, how excited I was that I was able to get to go to this, this, this school and learn and study with some of the smartest people? And now I was being told to drop out of school, which was, school was the necessary step to success. And now it was the barrier to success. So it was a really confusing time. And so I decided to drop out of school. It was a simple decision because school would be there uh, and uh, this opportunity to be able to run um, these programs wasn't. So I went into my uh, administrator's office, the equivalent of Mrs. Nelson but in Waterloo, and I said I'm dropping into school because now I have to go and start a company and move to Toronto and open an office and I have to hire four people. And they kind of laughed and they, they didn't realize what had actually happened over the course of these three months. And uh, and they said, okay, well, like, good luck with that as well. But they're actually quite, my University of Waterloo, I was really lucky. They were very supportive of it. Uh, so I dropped out of school. I moved to Toronto in January. And then I launched Redwood full time. Um, and then over the course of the next three years, we became the uh, leading millennial marketing company in Canada. And we had a team of 25 people. Uh, we started doing work in the US. So we were going back and forth between New York, pitching people across the US. And suddenly, like the light that I had and that fire inside kind of went out. And that was about a year and a half ago. And it was this really strange time where you had everything, you had this dream that you always thought you had, but about a year and a half ago, all of a sudden it was like, I actually don't really want to be doing this anymore. And the challenge that I had is that the vision behind the company, the idea of connecting young people with opportunity was something that I was very passionate about, but doing brand work or like launching products was not nearly accomplishing that vision at the speed that I wanted. I was going into the US and into Europe and into South America to talk to these business leaders and the speed for us to do it, and this is like our generation's biggest challenge is we want to do thing, everything fast and right now. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to do it running this agency. And so I actually took a step back uh, about a year and a half ago and I started interviewing CEOs around the world about how we could bring opportunity to us as young people, but in a way that we could do it all around the world. I wanted to do every single country. And, uh, and I was being challenged with my old business model to only do it in Canada. And so they, uh, they sat me down and they first of all said, you need to relax a little bit. Very similar conversations as what I heard before, so it just kind of flew over my head. And, uh, and what I had realized was through these conversations with CEOs, they all agreed that they needed all of us and they wanted to hear from us. But the challenge is that their businesses, the things that they were doing to be able to get young people on board was going to take way longer than what they actually needed. So there was this gap between where these businesses were and where they needed to be as it related to engaging young people, and they were really nervous about it. And these are CEOs of the biggest companies around the world telling me this. And so there's this gap that they said that their team doesn't know how to bridge. And I said, great, that's what we're trying to solve as well, because we know how to engage the next generation better than anybody else. And we're trying to find a global technology solution to do it, because only through technology will we be able to do it on a global scale in 12 months. And because that like global scale in 12 months, that like that line it w w doesn't even make like did, could not even exist five years ago, but now it can. And the second kind of insight or aha moment that we had from these CEOs is that although what they were doing as a company wasn't working, what they were individually doing that was working really well to understand and engage young people is that they were going for coffees. I was like, that's so strange that a CEO is going for coffee with people like us. Like, who would have thought? Like, I don't know if you guys have ever dreamed that, but imagine a big CEO at a Toronto or New York or London company wants to go for coffee with you to be able to just talk about what you care about and what you believe in. And so we took that back to the office on this mission to try to solve how we could, in 12 months, be around the world to connect with young people. And we thought, 
if they need to become an expert or they need to bridge that gap to, with the next generation and have the next generation become experts at them and then become experts at young people, what is an expert? And if you guys may have heard of the Malcolm Gladwell principle, 10,000 hours make an expert. So we're like, okay, 10,000 hours make an expert, but like the CEO can't do 10,000 hours with young people because they just don't have it. That could take 30 years. And a lot of them won't be um, working in 30 years. And what they're doing individually is they're going for coffees. And so we're like, okay, well, why don't we build a platform or a website that could do 10,000 coffees for cities, for areas, for companies, for regions, where as a collective community they can spend 10,000 hours sharing ideas together. Because coffee is such an easy way for these two people to connect. And I put together um, with my team a, just one sheet of paper. And the sheet of paper said, uh, what would happen if 10,000 of today's leaders meet with 10,000 of tomorrow's leaders over 10,000 coffees? And it had like a photo of me having coffee with some people on my team. And we brought that back to these CEOs in Europe, in South America, in Asia, Australia, the US, and Canada. And we put it down on their desks. And we said like, so we talked to you and now we're going to unveil this big idea. And we like put down this one, one, they're used to like 50 slides and we had one. And we said, what would happen if 10,000 of today's leaders meet with 10,000 of tomorrow's leaders, you guys, over 10,000 coffees? And all of them, like their jaws dropped. They were like, wow, like that would be so amazing. Like we'll do it in a heartbeat. And I thought on mine, I mean, it'd be so awesome if any young person could just go onto a website and find someone that they're interested in that they otherwise would have never been able to meet to just go and share ideas over coffee. They said, we're in. So that's when I realized we've, we had our technology solution to be able to create the first ever uh, website of opportunity for young people. And we're gonna call it 10,000 Coffees. And coffees is something in Northern Ontario you do all, like I did that all the time, whether it was before hockey or whether it was with my parents or, or role models that I had had. Coffee is just something that we're all used to doing in Northern Ontario. Coffee shops are a place of meeting. And we built that and in January 21st we launched it. And now I'm excited to say that we have over a thousand companies using it. We're just about ready to hit our 10,000 coffees milestone. Last week we heard there's an astronaut in Germany that's been using 10,000 coffees to meet Canadian scientists and this astronaut just hired a Canadian who never would have got to meet this guy and she's now moving to work at the space station in Germany all through a Skype coffee conversation and we had people who didn't get uh, jobs and were able to meet people through 10,000 coffees and now they're at their dream company that they never thought they'd be in. We have people who are in finance who are working some of the most grueling hours who are now working at arts organizations because that's where their passion had been but they'd never been able to meet people in arts before. And so after all of that, we took that one sheet and we sent it to a bunch of global CEOs and uh, since sending that, we're now launching in uh, 10 countries globally over the next 12 months. So we did it. And uh, we're finally going to be able to bring this movement to people in all of these different countries so that people like you as, you, as you're sitting in these seats thinking, you know, what do, what's out there? And maybe it's not your parents' kind of industries. And so as a result, it's challenging to see the different types of opportunities that exist out there. But the one great thing about rural Canada, especially in Northern Ontario, is that the amount of industries and opportunity in our region and in our own backyard is tremendous. And it's actually kind of a best kept secret in that so many opportunities to be entrepreneurs, to start small businesses, uh, to be able to get into arts and culture organizations or into the trades or everything in between actually exists in rural areas. And a lot of people don't know about it. And so with 10,000 Coffees Now, uh, and one of the big reasons why I'm back home other than Thanksgiving is that today we're working with business leaders in all different sectors so that they can use 10,000 coffees as a way to be able to help people like you uh, actually go and connect for coffee to share ideas with them. And uh, so over the next 12 months you'll see that we are going to do 10,000 coffees in Northern Ontario alone to connect thousands of young people with thousands of industry leaders to find out how we can make northern economies um, a world-class bench benchmark for how rural, Canadian, rural areas can really foster growth and opportunity with young people. Uh, so we're really excited uh, about that. 
Um, but in all that, and before we um, turn it over to, to questions, because um, I, I hope that your questions can spur I've left out tons of the entrepreneurial story and some of the most grueling failures and times which I'd, I'd be happy to share with you. I think the one thing that I want to I, I want to leave with you is that there's a simple math principle that you're uh, that's ingrained into you in grade nine, which is the y equals mx plus b. And in fact, they're probably teaching you in like grade seven now. Uh, but y equals mx plus b is all about lines and being able to have that trajectory into a career or just how everything is built based on a line. And the one thing that, we, that, that I really want everybody to realize is that life does not equal mx plus b. So your life is not going to be a linear path. You're going to make tons of mistakes. And I know how cliche it sounds that you're going to make failure, you're going to fail, you're going to make mistakes. But it is such a, uh, such a journey of going to different places and spaces and meeting new people and making mistakes and discovering things about yourself that you may never have realized before and passions that you have that you may not realize that you'd had and just something that you always got to keep in mind is just always stay curious stay humble and just keep working really hard and as you go through things as you may hit like some of the most challenging times where you're like what am I gonna do with my life or like, how am I ever going to get to a level of success? Is that you're just part of that non-linear journey? At this time, we need the senior boys football team to please report to the tunnel. Uh, best of luck, guys. Again. Be easy on Lively High School tonight, guys. Do not break any legs. Yeah. 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 No, don't. So, yeah. yes, nice to meet you guys. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the last note on all of that is, is that as you're sitting in the seats in grade, as a grade 11s and 12s and as you're in Northern Ontario, there are so many opportunities out there and just go out and get them. And one of the best quotes that I live with uh, all the time as I think about just going out and trying new things and getting out there um, is by uh, a legend, uh, Thomas Edison, who obviously created the light bulb. Uh, but I don't know if you've ever, in entrepreneurship, ever talked about Thomas Edison. Uh, but a really interesting story about him is that it took him over a thousand times to create the light bulb. Over a thousand times. So imagine you were to go tell your parents that you wanted to become an entrepreneur and you failed miserably the first time that you tried to go and do that. You'd probably sit down at the dinner table and your parents would say, you know, maybe you should, like, they'd probably tell you to try again after your first failure. Imagine after ten times that you failed. Your tenth time you sit back down at the dinner table, your parents are probably going to say, it's time to take a different path. Like you failed ten times. And imagine after the hundredth time or the thousandth time. Thomas Edison did it over a thousand times. And in fact, after he finally got a working prototype of the light bulb after a thousand times, he went in front of media, like this poor guy, after a grueling, you know, years and years and years to try to get this done. And the media, uh, said to him, he said, oh, Thomas, like, how does it feel to fail over a thousand times? Like, an obvious question, because I think we all know how it would feel to fail a thousand times. And he said, like a true entrepreneur, he said, oh, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb took over a thousand steps. I was like, that's an entrepreneur. So thank you.